Hi everyone, good Tuesday afternoon and welcome to Go Local Live. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel. Thanks for tuning in for the latest in news, politics, writing and more. I've got a full lineup for you today, but would like to welcome in my first guest, Professor Nadia Al-Ali from Brown. Thank you, Professor, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I very much appreciate your taking the time to come down the hill as an expert in the Middle East of the particular lens on women and gender want to talk about what's taking place in Syria. Uh, I would love if you would just introduce yourself to the audience, tell folks a little bit more about you and what to really look at as this is really dominating world news. Yeah, thanks Kate. So, yeah, I'm international professor here and professor of Middle East anthropology at Brown. And uh, for the last uh, two decades, I've uh, studied women and gender with reference to several countries in the Middle East, Iraq, Egypt, Lebanon. But most recently, I actually uh, studied the Kurdish women's movement, and I got involved with several uh, Kurdish women's organizations in Turkey and also in Syria and northern Iraq. And I think for me, one of the really, really um, compelling or you know, one of the most outrageous aspects of what is happening is that we have, for the first time, a political movement that actually centers women's equality and gender-based justice. It's a movement that says, you know, in the past, every time there were liberation struggles, whether they were against colonialism or against occupation or class struggle, women were always told, okay, let's solve the big issues, and then we will focus on women's issues. Now, the Kurdish political movement actually says, no, I mean, if we want justice, if we want equality, if we want radical democracy, gender-based equality, women's rights, it's at the center of it. And so what we actually see happening is um, in Syria, the uh, PYD, the Kurdish political organization that has been really running the semi-autonomous region of northern and eastern Syria, the underlying ideology is based on the Kurdistan Workers' Party in Turkey that started in the 80s. And the women in that movement since the 80s have been struggling uh, not only uh, to gain you know, positions within the army. I mean, what people know in this country is the fact that Kurdish women have been fighting ISIS. I think mm -hmm. many are aware, mm -hmm. but they don't know the history. How did we get to this? And the fact that, you know, Kurdish women have been involved in struggling for their political rights, both in the Kurdish political movement in Turkey and in Syria, you have a situation where any leadership position is actually shared by a man and a woman. You cannot have any more leadership positions with men only. So this, in this situation, the, it was like a, for many of us who really believe very strongly in gender-based equality. It was, you know, a utopia. It was a, you know, really, really positive, optim, you know, mm, well, uh, a movement that gave us hope. Uh, and now, unfortunately, uh, you know, the people who are being killed are the women who are fighting ISIS, and of course, the men as well. Were you surprised when President Donald Trump said that he was pulling U.S. forces out of northern Syria? To be honest, I wasn't surprised because nothing what Donald Trump says really surprises me. Um, but I think even in the context of what we've seen so far with this government, um, it was quite shocking. I mean, I, I would have hoped that even President Trump wouldn't go so far in betraying the very people that have been at the forefront of fighting ISIS. And you know, ISIS, when, when I think about it, um, in 2014, 2015, there were Yazidi women, um, Kurdish women, who were enslaved by ISIS. I mean, this made headlines in this media, yeah. right? Yeah. And it was the Kurds who were actually liberating those Yazidi women. And now, you let the very same Kurds die and on top of that, actually, one of the many horrible consequences of what is happening right now is that ISIS fighters are fleeing because the, uh, you know, the Kurdish um, parties in um, northern Syria and eastern Syria have been looking after hundreds and thousands of ISIS fighters. They are now running away, and they are now starting to group again. And what are we seeing here, especially, again, just from our lens here in the United States? Of course, we see reports as to what's taking place there right now. As you said, you think Americans have a sense of Kurdish women who had been involved at that forefront. Do, do you think we have a sense or we're getting that full picture of what's currently taking place right now? Not the full picture. I mean, I think the, 
Um, generally speaking, I think there has been quite a good coverage because I think that by and large, most people seem to be quite outraged what is happening, mm -hmm. um, but they don't understand that this is, I mean, it is already horrible that you know soldiers are dying and civilians are dying who have been fighting ISIS. But I think what they don't understand is that they're also destroying a whole utopian dream of equality because in this part of Syria, um, you know, the Kurds have been trying to build communities uh, that, you know, are sustainable in terms of agriculture, that are equal, that are fair, that are inclusive. And these very communities are being destroyed. And why, uh, you know, has Turkey dubbed, uh, you know, some organizations within the Kurdish community as terrorist organizations? Well, I mean, since its inception, uh, the Turkish government, the Turkish Republic, is a republic that's very much based on marginalizing people who are not ethnically Kurd. Mm -hmm. The Turk, sorry. You know, in, in the past it was uh, the Armenian genocide. Kurds, uh, you know, for hundreds of years have been marginalized. And they, of course, radicalized. And in the 80s, you started this uh, resistance movement. Mm -hmm. um, and it is true that initially, the PKK, when it started, it was um, asking for its own independent Kurdistan. And as part of that, it was involved in an armed struggle. But actually, for the past years, uh, the PKK the, and the wider Kurdish political movement is not even asking for an independent mm. state anymore. I mean, I find that really, really surprising. I mean, this is a people who never had an independent state. They're saying, no, we want equal citizenship rights. We want, you know, to be recognized. We want our language to be spoken. We want our children to be able to go to school and learn Kurdish. We want to have we want to live in peace, you know, we want, don't want to experience the brutal crackdowns at the hands of the Turkish government. When I was um, in southeastern Turkey in 2015, I experienced, I saw with my own eyes, how the Turkish government, the police, was cracking down brutally uh, on civilian population. And so what we're hearing from the president now, President Trump saying that he wants to take sanctions against Turkey for the, uh, uh, what some say is the inevitable actions mm -hmm. when the U.S. pulled out of Syria, is that enough? It's not enough. It's a first step. And I'm personally also advocating for boycotting uh, Turkey, both in terms of tourism, in terms of products, in terms of academia. Sanctions is not enough. It's also you know stopping arms, putting more pressure on the government. Uh, it's uh, a bit, uh, you know, uh, it's a little, it's a bit too little too late, but, you know, better late than never, and something needs to happen very, very quickly. And how big is the U.S.'s role, both A, pulling out of Syria, and then B, now having the president saying he's going to invoke sanctions? Uh, you know, what role does the U.S., if any, still play? Obviously, again, all eyes taking place on what's transpiring there now. Um, you know, does the U.S. still have a key role or not? It does, it does. I mean, there were, you know, relatively small number of troops, there were a thousand, you know, soldiers there, and they made the big difference. And even hundred soldiers would make a big difference. Even, you know, saying there is, there should be a no-fly zone with, you know, U.S. planes flying, controlling the airspace. Um, and of course, we, the situation is such that uh, the Kurds, because they feel betrayed, they feel, you know, they are now fighting for their lives, for their communities, they felt forced to actually negotiate with President Assad of Syria, who is, of course, supported by Russia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think one of the big dangers that we uh, might see unfolding is that you see mm -hmm. Turkey on the one hand, uh, and then on the other hand, um, you know, Syria and Russia. And if the U.S. gets involved at this point, I mean, this could really... Uh, blow up if it's not done properly. But I think that it is still not too late for uh, the government to actually contain the situation and to stop the bloodshed from getting worse. Well, while we have you in studio, anything else you want viewers to know, we very much appreciate your taking the time to come down from Brown and explaining exactly what's at stake here as we're all watching through the lens of the United States. What would you like viewers to know? Well, I'd like, um, you know, I think in this country, lots of times people think, when I think about the Middle East, they think about oppressed women, you know, passive women. And I have to say, I've never in my life felt so inspired and impressed than when I met Kurdish women activists in southeastern Turkey, in Istanbul, also in Iraqi Kurdistan. You know, women who have been really devoting their lives 
to address issues, you know, to challenge authoritarianism. They have been at the forefront of challenging political authoritarianism. They have been fighting, you know, with their bodies militarily, but also politically. Mm -hmm. And they had the support of uh, the Kurdish leader, Abdullah Öcalan, who has been very much promoting women's rights. But I don't for a minute believe that women were handed women's rights. They had to fight for it, you know, at every step. And many of the, you know, I had one uh, Turkish women's rights activist, she told me, you know, our struggle with the Turkish state, it would take five articles in the constitution to, to address that. Uh, but, you know, we also are actually struggling with our Kurdish men. And for me, that was so moving for a woman who, you know, is oppressed by the government, by mm. the Turkish government, who doesn't have a state, but to recognize that her struggle is also a struggle against, you know, patriarchy more broadly. I, I was very, very moved by that. Well, again, appreciate your coming down and sharing your perspective with us. And with viewers here, don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. But again, I want to thank Professor Al-Ali. Thank, thank you so much. I appreciate it. We'll be right back.